Okay, I have the time is 6.30. So we'll call this work session of the Mayor and Council for the City of Snowville, Georgia. To order for Monday, October 28, 2019. First, we'll go through the regular business meeting. See if anybody has any questions. Um, Bishop Jerry Hutchins isn't going to be here for the invocation. Is there anyone who wants to do that? Kelly wants to. As long as you want to. We did? Okay. Got Kurt Schultz doing the pledge. Got a proclamation for Small Business Saturday. Um, we're doing the Scarecrow presentations tonight. Uh, and then we just have the minutes, some uh, reports. And then public hearing, we've just got the second reading on the clarification for the code enforcement um, ordinance. Under old business, um, the town center public relations contract. Do you want to go over what was adjusted on that? Sure. I'm not sure everybody's good with this. So I think last time everyone had some serious concerns with the contract from Intrepid. And I made a few changes, and it's on the second to the last page of the contract you all had, which is under the fee structure. And what I added, and I'll just read what I added. Okay. Um, it says, on, I changed the first three. We don't have the electronic. Hmm. First, I've got a couple of extra copies yeah. that were yeah. going. I just gave him mine, Chuck. Okay. Say yours for sure. Roger, you don't want to use those down there. This is on the second to the last page. So they, they have been wanting a guaranteed two thousand dollars a month with no oversight by us. And so we changed that um, that they um, uh, that we will pay one thousand dollars per month for the services. Um, however, um, they have to um, uh, be strategies for the municipal development parcels and um, they have to either directly or jointly benefit the municipal development parcels. Um, also, we're not obligated for services, we're only obligated for services that fall under that and if anything is over $1,200 per month, that has to be approved in writing by the mayor and city council. But basically, no marketing can be used for stores, for apartments, or any of that, all the marketing has to be for the municipal development parcels. Or for the portion that or we're for paying for. Or for our portion of it, exactly. That we're paying for. Because it is, it's one contract, and we're sharing the expenses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with Casto. Just like the unveiling of the logo. Right. I mean, that's 50-50. Uh, right. Uh, is everyone the, the main thing it gives us that back that control to where there's not like Casto can't be pulling a trigger saying hey go do this extra project and then we're on the hook for half of it so this anything like that happens it's going to have to come back so that everybody knows that it's happening before that before anything can be spent and then we can you know just make sure what it is mm -hmm. control the cost. <laughs> Now, they have not approved necessarily these changes, but my suggestion is for you all to go ahead. If you all are, you know, want to go ahead and approve them, go ahead and approve them, and then it will be submitted as is, and they can decide to accept it or not accept it the way we prepared it. Um, under new business, I'll have a nomination for Betty Ann Kuman to be uh, appointed to post five with the Board of Appeals. The contracts. Oh, that's replacing okay. Marilyn Swinney on the post. We've got um, the approval of the property purchase at 1689 Summit Place Way. Um, putting this on for council approval before we have closing on this property. So this is, everybody knows what property this is? The dam. Yeah, this will be the, well, this will be a, a yeah, emergency mm -hmm. exit only mm -hmm. should mm -hmm. something happen at the, the dam, dam at Timberline. Yeah. Um, so no roadways would be open up there unless something were ever to happen. So we need a purchase somehow? 
This is where we budgeted 250 and we negotiated it down to 235, $235,000. So is it okay for them to put that in the motion not to exceed yes. 235? Well, with closing costs, it'll probably exceed 235. So you well, there'll be some there'll be some legal costs, but there'll also be some prorated taxes which will lower it. Right. We go to 240 just to cover. Put sales price. Sales price sale. 235. Yeah. Don't want to box this in. Uh, item C is a first reading <coughs> uh, for Chapter 34, Health and Sanitation Codes. That's a big that's a big oh, that's big. And. We had already had included this in the packet that went out. Uh, however, um, uh, Gretchen sent out this morning an email to everybody with a concern. Um, I think we were fine without it, but uh, it did read, well, the packet you all received just says that smoking and vaping are prohibited in all publicly owned places, including enclosed facilities, buildings, and vehicles owned or operated by the city. And what I suggested, and, and no one seemed to have a conflict with, was I added the words and on so that it now reads smoking and vaping are prohibited in and on all publicly owned places including enclosed facilities, buildings and vehicles owned or operated by the city. And that just keeps it in line again as we've talked before with what's already in place with smoking and tobacco products. Do we need to note that change when we make a motion? I've, no, I've made a copy of change. It's okay. Copy. It's just a first read. Oh, that's read, right. So. That's right. It's a first read. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Melissa, do you need that now? Yeah. 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 That, I took a draft off. And then it'll be advertised as the right. final copy. Right. Right. Uh, and then we have item D, the extension of the uh, service delivery strategy. Um, so what's going on with the SDS negotiations? Um, the due date to have the approvals done is October 31st. And out of all of the services, we're in agreement on everything except we're down to and still stuck on the 911 revenue sharing for the police cities. Um, we're close, but we're still not quite there yet. So it did require the extension to prevent everybody from going into... Um, losing local government status and all of that mess. So that Gwinnett County Commission amended their agenda last Monday and added the extension. So now all the cities are having to pass the extension as well. So this actually gives us an extension to February. End of February. End of February. But um, Charlotte and I have both pledged, I mean, our goal is to have this wrapped up by the end of November. Um, so that we're not falling into next year at all. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm just asking for your support on extending that. And do then, we need to say to the end of February? No, or, no. February no, just, just yeah. extension. Okay. Yeah. I have that resolution there. Do you, do you want to have them just approve the resolution? Yeah, you could approve. Do you have the resolution number? It's 2019-19. So you could reference the resolution. I just crossed that out. Okay. And then uh, we've got two um, confirmations for the Snowball Tourism and Trade Association. So this is the council's um, board members that will be appointing Jared Eakins. That's how you say his name, isn't it, Kelly Eakins? Mm -hmm. And uh, Billy Franklin is a reappointment. Okay. So that's it for the regular meeting. Move on to any correspondence. No, ma'am. So the attorney's report? We're going to need the executive session. Uh, projects? We'll uh, um, go down through the first item, uh, town center. Um, on go good progress, I'd say, with all parties. Uh, we have a meeting Wednesday where we, we will be discussing the zoning submission as well as an update on the, uh, the design of, the, um, of, the, uh, of Phase 1 and really a general update. 
Uh, I wanted to give you, attached to your update, you have a packet of three handouts. Uh, the first one uh, is a, and it's not even an e exhaustive list, but these are the current activities that we're engaged in regarding the town center, the Grove at town center development. Uh, I mean, it ranges from dealing with um, the, the our, our development partner, uh, coordinating with the county. Obviously, we still have a lot of business with the Postal Service. Smallwood is uh, their architect, landscape architect. We're working with them on the site plan, making sure that uh, uh, we have the ingredients that we want in there. Wolverton is the uh, engineer. They're doing the traffic study, engineering, and site work uh, background. Um, route design, we're working with Michael Kidd for his input. He should have a proposal shortly. It'll probably be on the next agenda. Uh, we're taking site visits. We've been to Halcyon. We're going to um, uh, Peachtree Corners and, and Duluth. Uh, we also have taken tech visits. Uh, MRI uh, was a fascinating plant uh, who does uh, digital technology, and it's, it's technology that will really wow people coming into the town center. We'll talk more about that. We're working on the bond process. Uh, budget oversight and review. Uh, we talk to people almost almost every day about getting real world confirmation for our budget numbers. So just kind of look through there. Know that um, it is not it, it's not one or two things. I mean, we have a lot going on. So uh, if you have any questions there, uh, please uh, let me know. And the the final two things are uh, uh, talking points based on what may come out of the, uh, the publicizing of the logo. Uh, people might have uh, um, questions about the, the plan, the site plan, uh, anything. This is some good notes to, uh, to have in mind when you get those questions. And then finally, just uh, this is kind of an addendum to those, uh, uh, to those notes, some positive talking points uh, about why, about what the town center will do for us and why it's important. So look through there. Any questions that you have, please let me know. Uh, <clears throat> continue to work. We've got uh, a discussion regarding the uh, uh, IGA, the addendums that we need to, to get back on the library design work. Uh, city marketing, Brian is working closely with, with Intrepid. I'm sorry I was not here a couple weeks ago um, to, to go over that contract. Believe me, nothing is going to happen in that contract without Eric and I having oversight over it. We are not going to let them go crazy on expenses, and we're going to make sure that what we pay for is in the public realm. So um, we, 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 we certainly understand where you're coming from on that. Uh, the UDO, <clears throat> Jason, I guess we really don't have a, a timeline yet to no, adoption. We're, all, we're almost there for the first draft. Okay, yeah. all right. I know you're inputting, uh, uh, adding the, what uh, input from the mayor and council work session. Roundabout construction, uh, it's starting to take shape when you go out there. You can kind of see the limit of the project, mm -hmm. uh, the grading and clearing that is going on, and you can certainly see why we needed to, to acquire the Polanco property. <laughs> Um, 78 and 124, talking to Robert Moon, paving and striping is about 90% complete. Um, I think they've done a good job. It's incredibly uh, uh, smooth. They still have clower to do and some of the some of the driveways. Uh, I think they've done a good job. Their uh, their schedule has not changed. Major work done by Christmas. Um, we talked about the SDS negotiations earlier, um, and the police cities are meeting regularly to uh, look at all our options. Uh, SPLOS program and ordinance development. Uh, you've got vaping tonight, and there's really no other change there. Any questions on that? Are they going to put more signage on 124 South driving north? Because that still seems to be a prize. I've seen cars come up and try to make a right into the oncoming <coughs> traffic. I'll have to look at that. I haven't been down there to see if there's, if there's not enough signage or if people are just unable to read. Yeah, yeah there are no, no less than six signs yeah. right now with no left turn. So people just aren't looking. No right no left. 
There's no right either. It should say it's no both. turns. I know, but it's both. There's coming up that way. There are signs all over the place. Okay. But yeah, you're talking about northbound on northbound. one point. Yeah, yeah I haven't been down that way. So okay. I'm, Is that the area you're concerned yeah, about? Yeah, because that's what I've seen. People going turns. north trying to turn. They're east turning right and right. left in the intersection. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The signs are like way before the intersection, so I think they're not even paying attention before they get to the intersection because we've seen it where they turn, but the signs are. I would say like a hundred feet or so before the actual intersection. So I would think I'm, if it was at the intersection, yeah. they'd be like, oh. Like, I'm hoping they're going to have arrows painted on the lanes. Mm -hmm. That would help oh, there. when they're, they're done. Not completely. Yeah. It'll be much more, it'll be much yeah. clearer when that's done. Um, and it's just like uh, on you know, 285, if you're going over the big bridge, 85 north, I mean, it picks up a mile ahead of time. I mean, it tells mm -hmm. you 85 north, this lane yeah. and the south. I love it when they have like the things painted on the street mm -hmm. so you yeah. know exactly what lane to be in. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing is 78 eastbound. Mm -hmm. Noticed that where the crossover to make a southbound turn onto 124 at that stoplight, people are doing a U-turn there where, where the uh, cutout is. So somebody coming eastbound is making a U-turn where that um, curb cut is, where that opening is, and also people pulling out of the shopping center, Provino's shopping center, are using that, trying to cut through to hit the eastbound traffic. So, uh, hmm. so you're like saying eastbound traffic is going south on 124 and then making a U-turn? I don't know where in the heck they're coming from. Uh, no, no, they're living dangerous. They're, no, people are people are headed eastbound on 78. Okay. And then they're doing a U-turn. Oh, to get back into Provino's. To well, oh. to they're like they're going into Provino's, but then headed oh. westbound. So they, I'm driving along. I can't you know, swivel and watch. They're making a U-turn on going. 78. Yeah, they're making a U-turn yeah. okay. on 78. Okay. Okay. Green. No, no. No, 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 no. The next cut up where 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 there's the stop line oh, yeah. where I've we seen do them. the cross. I've seen them do that. the left turn. Yeah. And then people coming out of the shopping center trying to wiggle through there, which is a little bit hairy. <laughs> right there. Okay. Yeah, when we've had events out on the green, you look out and there's people making U turns. But that's coming down to, to Oak Road and yeah. then there you turn in there. Yeah, yeah, I think they Is it U turn? Legal there? I didn't I'm think sure so. they're going to mark it. Right yeah. Now. They don't yeah. Okay. Okay. Next up, we have Gay Johnson with the recycling program changes. Are you leading this? Not good. <laughs> Not good. No. Um, I'm handing out. Um, you got a handout. General information about yeah. the. Uh, recycling situation that is going to take effect on uh, January 1st. Uh, we will now be charged, or our hauler will now be charged to the processor that we take our stuff to, $60 a ton. We're being charged for recycling. Whole new ballgame. We no longer get a rebate. Um, when they went to the mixed um, pickup, you know, a lot of contaminants. They pulled the glass, as we all know, which was the biggest contaminant when, because of them using a rear loader and just smashing the uh, recyclables in the truck. So, but now we do not have anyone purchasing our recyclables overseas with that situation. Um, the cost to the processor is more than what they were able to pay out. So luckily we've got a good um, relationship with Pratt Industries who is the person that, or the company that we take all our recyclings to. So it's $60 a ton versus in Metro Atlanta there's a lot of places that are charging $100 a ton. In our contract with Advanced, um, we worked it to where versus them bringing certain recyclables to the center, they would collect them all and pay us so much for everything, which worked out to about 35 cents a household. So, as you will 
see, that will go away because our hauler can no longer give us a rebate if they're being charged for what they take. Um, and I broke down what we're already having to subsidize to make things work for um, sanitation and recycling without billing our customers. Um, and it was 730000 That's what's estimated to be. Now, if we look at our total tonnage, and I use last year's fiscal year so I can get a full yeah. year, uh, we had 645.27 tons of recycling off our curbside. If you multiply that time our new cost of $60 a ton, you see the 38716 which is going to increase what we'll have to be asking for um, subsidizing the sanitation budget. So I just feel like that everybody needs to kind of know what we're looking at. This is not going down. We've got new subdivisions, and our cost is going to go up. And this is not... It's not just an extra thirty-eight thousand. It's really about sixty thousand, right? Because we're losing this the rebate and paying more. Mm. Sixty-eight thousand. Gotta take back my clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gay, are we? We're still making money on the recyclables that we're taking in down at the recycling center. Well, so, no, the, as I explained. We do get some from our cardboard. We no longer get anything for our plastics. We're holding, or bailing and holding our plastics, thank goodness for our bailer building, hoping that the market will go back up and then we can turn around and sell and at least get something to help offset the cost. But right now, nothing for plastics. Um, glass is not very much, but because we do take it, we have gotten glass from everywhere in Metro Atlanta. So we're making a little bit more because we sort it. So our processor still takes it sorted. That's the key. It's not our, it's our glass is clean, what they call clean glass. And cardboard is the only paper we're making any money on. Yes. Everything else we aren't. Our, just yeah. our newspaper, our, um, you know, just, just, general, just yeah. general white paper, no longer. Mm -hmm. Do we get anything? Um, and let's face it, we've never made money on recycling. It's no. always been the environmental mm -hmm. right thing to do. Um, but we just, when, when Gay came to me with this, I felt like when the budget discussion starts, we'll have to look at uh, the overall program and mm -hmm. see what our options are. Mm -hmm. So on the, like the paper recycling and everything, I mean, it is still being recycled, right? We're just not oh, getting yes. paid for we it. Still, <laughs> it's worked in our contract with Advance that they do haul our newspaper and our um, mixed paper. So they do haul that to Pratt. As of right now, while they're not paying us, they are not charging us because we separate our stuff. That's the key. Anything off the curb is going to be mixed, and they, they're not going to take it. Right. Um, unless they charge. So what happens to all that stuff from the curb then, the curbside pickups? Well, right now it's still going there, but they're just okay. going to charge because of the cost to separate it. So, mm -hmm. well, so they take uh -huh. it, but they charge right. us to take it. And a good thing about Pratt is they use certain items and burn it for fuel because they also go and pick up like the front load cardboard containers and stuff. So they're very... You know, they use everything that mm -hmm. is taken. <coughs> okay. <coughs> well, thanks for that. Great news, Gabe. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> You've made our day. Yes. Does anybody, anybody think they'll ever have a resurgence of cost? I'm sorry? Does anybody in the industry ever think it's going to come back? Yes. They did, you know, and that's why I would discourage doing away with items that we take uh, at the recycling center or at the curb. I mean, as long as it's being used in some way, then I feel like it's important. And I don't think our citizens would be very happy if we took away yeah. their recycling no. And, no. Mm -hmm. and, and the center. I just, you know. It's hard to go back. When you build up that culture and then you right. go, it, it's, 
It would yeah, be hard to make a U-turn there. Right. But if the material is going into a landfill somewhere anyway, um, are we paying more or less to haul off recyclables than just regular garbage? Well, now what is the landfill cost for garbage is somewhere around forty-five. Now it's now we're to take our recycling at sixty, so right. it's more. Okay. Mm. Well, and and so my question is. Are we sure that our contractor is actually doing anything with the recycling other than dumping it? Because yes, I, 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 I am completely sure. Okay. I just don't no want to doubt. pay him no. $60 because the view since we changed over to the new hauler that they dump it in the back of what looks just like a regular garbage truck it's instead of separating it yeah. out um, is that it's just going to the dump anyway. No, and I don't want to pay extra to put it in a landfill. Yeah. No, we get the tonnage, so I get the tonnage every month. I know exactly how much tonnage for sanitation and I know exactly how much tonnage for recycling. Okay. Okay, item C, we've got a uh, discussion of parking enforcement and booting. Okay. For There's uh, an attorney I don't know if you got one of these that <clears throat> apparently tries to get cities and counties to pass no booting ordinances and then he goes after the booting companies and sues them if they continue to do it. <clears throat> what I thought was interesting here is he just has a list of the cities and counties who have passed no, boot no booting ordinances. And I just wanted you to be aware of what else is going on. I don't know that we want to pass an ordinance to prevent it. I, my problem is with the predatory practice. And I think we need to think of an, or, of an ordinance and enact an ordinance that basically says, here's how you do it, and if you go beyond that, you're gone. Because it's the people hiding in the shadows waiting for somebody. You know, if you're warned and you say, I don't care, that's on you. Right. But if you park somewhere unknowingly, if the signage isn't right, then I think uh, I think that's something we need to stop. And then Jason has some information about one of the causes of this problem in that shopping center is that AJ, the Barron's guy, actually asked for a reduction in parking mm -hmm. in his center. So he's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have that stuff with you? Yeah, I can or just, just to let them know, it was the 10 percent, and and the people as far as village have added parking spaces. Mm -hmm. He parks a truck in one of them, so he loses one because he's parking a truck there for advertising, and then he requested a 10 percent reduction. When it was yeah, on. let me just go over here, and I sent you guys all an email too with all the other stuff. So um, I looked at it a couple ways as far as how we parked it, and then what kind of led you know, kind of the timeline. So Barron's was um, submitted for, and that's the promenade, which is AJ's property. And it was submitted for rezoning by him in 2003 uh, for the 19,000 nearly square foot um, retail center, as well as the office for 17,000 square feet. So um, he was requested and issued um, a reduction of 10%, which the total would have been per the required code at the time and the current code, 137 spaces. Uh, he requested a 10% reduction for the entire development, so that was 14 spaces, and then another 10 spaces were reduced um, as part of an administrative variance, and that was in uh, February 18th of 2004, bringing his total from 137 to 112. So. Um, that left him deficient 24 spaces per the code and, and part of that uh, justification was that they would share parking, they would be off peak hours and that there was interparcel access between the shopping centers around, uh, not limited to Forest Village, but it was uh, uh, that people could share parking. So it was approved once again 10% on top at the zoning and then another 10 uh, which is in the code uh, during the development process. So. Um, we broke that center down too based on use, which isn't required. Um, 
right now, if you're over 15,000 square feet, you can park it one per 250 spaces minimum and one per 225 maximum. So I went through and then actually parked it based on the restaurants and the use and then the office. And uh, it would require, if you broke down each use, which isn't always typical because with a larger shopping center, you have, you know, just different uses that can complement and, and coexist where you're not at a max factor all the time. And these are, these are maximum numbers. So um, per the current uses in their square footage, including Lowe's, Jimmy John's, and the office buildings, um, it would be required at 168 spaces. And um, right now, they only have, uh, what is it, 100 and 112, 12. right? Mm -hmm. So there's some deficiencies there. Now, a lot of times the office buildings are empty. I don't know how much they're getting used over the weekends. Um, so, you know, I can't speak to that. And we did the same thing uh, just to see where we, uh, the issue, you know, to identify the lower shopping center, I guess the northern one, Forest Village. It was originally parked at, um, the maximum, which was one per 225 square feet at nearly 19,000 square feet. So they had a total of uh, 84 required. They asked for an administrative variance to increase it, bring it up to, I believe the total number was 92. And um, that was as of approval. And now they have, um, they added, 25 off-site spaces next to Roll It Up, which is are shared with that salon that are used by employees. And then they also added 13 brand new spaces when they took the ATM out machine. And they're at 138, and their breakdown by use, they'd be required to have 177. Just some things of note, when that center was originally parked in 2003, it was parked as a shopping center and it showed the same amount of restaurants minus the sandwich place. So Tijuana Flats was there at first. So it wasn't like First Watch was added as an additional restaurant and they were parked as a restaurant under that shopping center coat. So they're deficient. Where was Tijuana Flats? Then? Right where First Watch is. I thought that was a yeah. bank. They were in Mexico. Well, they had it on the yeah. site plan. They showed it. So no, it was, so was Washington. The first watch was a bank. Yeah. The first watch was Little Mexico. Here's the uh, here's some site plans if you guys want to see. Well, I I was a customer there at Washington Mutual. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't remember the name of the bank. It was a bank. It was Washington. He said Washington. Yeah. So is there, I guess what we need to know, does, does council want to take out any action on food? Legally, what can we do? I think because we just need to make it to where they are not predatory. Well, or, you know, I would suggest that we put in requirements of better signage. I saw that up today. If you guys have been there recently, mm -hmm. there's a um, kind of where the other, like, walls of text were. There's actually a bigger sign on AJ's property on the entrances and the exits that shows if you patronize these companies, basically, and uh, all the guys down here you cannot park. Here. And it's a visual picture. It's much, I mean, it's a lot better. Than Is it the red line picture that yes. he sent us? Yes, and he's got those posted, I think, mm -hmm. at both entrances. But if, if but I'm what about, walking, yeah, yeah you'd it see visible? it on the way down, yeah, from the front parking lot. Because um, it's right there, as it's kind of facing. The parking up, spots, I should pull Yeah, them. Up. like the same, it's in the same spot as those text walls. The, the other signs were, you know, just the text that probably nobody reads. But um, they're visible. They're, you can see them now. I mean, you could still walk past them uh, on the sidewalk and maybe miss them, but you would probably see them when you're coming in. Um, it's just something you'd have to look at and feel like you can feel yeah, like it's Yeah, well, I'll drive through there. Mm -hmm. I think um, I talked to the property owner on uh, 
as far as village and he got a complaint from somebody from that got sent directly to first watch for somebody I think they concluded last night. Yeah, I I got they copied me on that yeah, as well. So he's got um, you know, he got that directly and called me and um, just wanted to let me know that he was aware and they're not gonna you know, they're not gonna boot anybody, he said. So it seems to me the the problem really occurred once first watch moved in. Yeah, well, I, I mean, think that's when the parking uh, deficiency yeah, really showed Yeah, I mean, the, the, the parking deficiency really became a problem. Maybe they were deficient before, but when that was a bank, it wasn't really a problem. I just, I mean, I think there's too many restaurants. I think First Watch needs to find a bigger location. I do, too. But but they in the meantime, I, I don't want to see predatory booting. I, I just, it, booting's going to make people angry. It's you know what's worse it's for is having your car towed it's away. It's worse to have it, it towed. It costs a lot I know. more and it takes hours and hours to get it back. And you got to hope that you got somebody around that can take you where you got to go. Yeah. I guess you live so, Uber. I don't know that we want to ban it. I just think we need ordinances in place so it can't be abused. The, the, uh, I, the gentleman who sent the letter to David said that there are some places that have fined up to $1,000. So as I sent out an email a month ago, I have no problem with requiring a booting company to have people in some sort of uniform that clearly states who they work for, because otherwise Roger and I can go down there in t-shirts and hold people up for 75 bucks a piece. I'm not against that, Roger, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> costs a lot to keep them kids in clothes but uh, and so that and maybe a maximum fine um, I also I personally like the idea of them being licensed uh, have a business license here in the city of Snellville because if you're gonna operate here in such a capacity you gotta mm -hmm. have a business license but I'm personally I think these two property owners are cutting each other's throat and mm -hmm. I I will not yeah. go to any business in those shopping centers at this point. Well that's every email mm -hmm. and contact right. I'm right. getting is that so I'm never going back there again. That's right. what I said. It's, just it'll be a short term us. problem because they're exactly. losing so much business that right. they're not going to have a problem with parking. just need a parking deck. <laughs> well and so I'm not sure that <laughs> legislation is necessary but I do think it's appropriate to, that people be professional in their appearance if they're going to hold you up for 75 bucks, bless you. Right. So can we maybe look at our towing ordinance and put in some language in there on the booting? I mean. Requirements of that if you're going to have a booting company on your property that we specify what type of signage has to be presented and then what about the, license or what about them having to warn people before they and how can you document it? Is that yeah, yes? I, she said yeah, yes, we can I, do you that. You can put that in there. If they, if they don't provide notice prior to, then they could be cited for a violation of the same ordinance if you pass it. Well, and, and we could we could enforce that. I mean, button. at least then people have the option to say you to know move. move. It, right. But I, I think they've got to have that notice. I agree that I think they ought to have their own business license and proof of insurance just like we put in our regular towing orders but non contention with towing on private property is different right. than towing from the public rights away mm -hmm. so we just need to make sure we're doing the right thing right. Okay. okay all right so if you can work up some kind of draft and just email it out to everybody to look at okay okay future zoning and development of scenic drive Okay, so just to kind of bring you uh, up to speed on the area, if you guys, is right down next to our marquee entrance sign. Uh, Scenic Drive was originally uh, developed as a, you know, a small parcel um, residential, kind of residential estate lots. And then back in 2000, in the early 2000s, when CI, Civic Institutional, an office professional was created from um, O and I. 
the two different districts were taken apart, they took that opportunity to basically rezone that whole street, I assume, in an attempt to kind of redevelop um, some of those homes and, and maybe, you know, have some kind of master development there. But anyways, that was, you know, close to, I would say, 15 to 20 years ago. And at this time, there's only a few businesses that have moved in. And now, um, what we've heard a lot in the last, I would say, three to six months is people are trying to sell these homes and move. And... Um, they can't necessarily sell. There's really no market for um, an office professional type use. We do have the uh, people that make the dental implants and the crowns are there. There's uh, one uh, doctor's office kind of across the street there that's been on the market for a while. And then I believe Tony Clower is about to redevelop one of the uh, other properties. So that's the only kind of commercial uses there. So the, the rub has been that um, they're putting them up for uh, commercial use and they've sat there. Uh, Darlene Phillips has one listing. It's been like three months where she tried to sell it commercially. It would not sell. We talked to a similar lady that was trying to sell uh, commercially. It would not sell. So now these people are trying to leave, uh, which brings in new lenders for new buyers and the mortgage companies will not uh, lend against a non-conforming use. So right now they can continue to live in the homes just like anything else and they're basically legally non-conforming <coughs> or grandfathered. At any time if there's an absence in occupancy for more than 18 months they would basically not be allowed to resume the residential uh, use of the property. So basically forcing them into an office professional. And we've had three instances of this just kind of in the last uh, three months. So here's, there's, uh, you know, a couple different options. Um, we've already got kind of a mixture of office use in there. So either kind of stick to it, uh, the, the land use plan and the zoning plan, and I guess allow it to continue to kind of move on down the road and then see if there's more conversions to come in the future. Um, B, you could allow for individual property owners to come back in and request um, an amendment to the land use map and the zoning map just have to be mindful uh, there that um, there will be like 50 foot buffers around these office professional uses if they were to come in later um, or you know you could down zone the whole thing and then you're making some of those OP uses non-conforming so you know, there's kind of the extremes on both ends and then the middle. And as far as the offices that are there now, I don't believe they've really had any kind of adverse impacts on uh, the residents there. But most of the original owners are gone at this point are moving out. So there's one only three year old lady that's trying to move in camp because the lenders won't lend against Zone, We're giving her a letter then? No, I mean, we can't really give her. There's nothing we can do except send her a zoning certification. Mm -hmm. so. so tell me, just so that I'm clear, the area in blue, is all of is all of it zoned it is. OP? It was yeah. zoned. It was zoned and a, it's on the future land use map this way. Right, and it was done as part of like a wide scale change when they took O&I Office Institutional and broke it down to OP, Office Professional, and Civic Institutional. So I guess at that time, they identified some areas that might be good uh, for converting, and this was one of them. It just hasn't really, it hasn't really oh, gone no. all the way, because I guess there's no so, visibility. And the ones with the OP on there are actually operating businesses? No, no that's just or the that's labels. But okay. there's, the big long one is the dental place. Uh -huh. uh, the doctor's office, I believe, is across the street, the first one on your right. And then Tony Clower's new place, I believe, is on uh, one, two, isn't it right here? Here? This one. Okay, so the, there's none in the rear. There's this one, this one, and this one, I believe. And the rest are, and there's a cell tower on the back, too. And the, and the grade, and the, I mean, it's a big piece of rock, too. It's, I think it's and I don't, I don't see anybody moving because it's uphill all the way back. 
and I can't see I can't see anybody going office professional back in here. There's much better places to be. Yeah, I don't think the market supports it, honestly, and not now, and I don't know if it will ever, so I don't know, you know, what the fix is. There's a few options. So can we do like a wholesale rezone back to residential? Well, I mean, we can change the zoning map, but, um, but you know, that's they still a, have to come in for rezoning. No, no, we could do it as a city, but then that opens up a whole other kind of due process uh, as far as notification, and then you have to be mindful of the businesses that are already I here and have invested too. So it could create um, some issues. Um, on either side, so hmm. or they could come in individually and can deal with them on a case by case basis. I don't there's some a, a cost associated with that too to citizens. Yeah. Well, twenty two nineteen, which is I guess the one you were talking about, Clower, that one's Tony Clower, that one's which under one? contract pending sale and which one is that on here up on the right is it as you come in is it on the right yeah it's on the right hand side uh what i think fourth one back okay i'm skipping back and forth between um no i'm sorry it's not it's uh currently covenant counseling institute incorporated joe w whitewell at all so he's yeah, the fourth one, if you count uh, the dental place, it's on the actual fronting on 78. That's the, you mean the where the sign is, our sign is? That's the existing one, I think. It's not, no. Wait, where was our this one? There. Right. Oh, oh. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at it. Yeah. yeah. So. Whitwell is here. Yeah, this one is, is Whitwell. Mm -hmm. Um. This one's Clower, yeah. and I show another one, but I, the address doesn't match. Um, so it's the third one on the. If you're looking at it from the cul-de-sac at the bottom, it'd be the third one down um, on the right-hand side. That one's under contract, also. So. And that's twenty two fifty eight. That's the one with the Darlene has. Okay. Mm -hmm. well. But it's under contract, but you're saying it's not gonna sell if they can't. Well they can't it finance it, especially if you're on an FHA loan or something. You know, they're just uh, when they appraise it, they're appraising it at you know, at OP. So it's it's throwing kinks in the in the lending process. Anybody have any thoughts? <clears throat> just like if they want to sell it as BG or OP or residential, just they come in and say, hey, I'm trying to do this, and then we look at it and then say, cool, and then that's it. Well, they have to go through the process. It's yeah, going to cost them money. Yeah, and it's, you know, and it's time. Yeah, it's 90 days. and um, But, I mean, that's really kind that's of the, better than the sensible I know. way to do it instead of taken on and making massive changes if that's how they want to do it, you know, I mean, it's the opportunity for the adjoining property owners, if they are a business, to be notified and you can, you know, condition that property that, you know, no buffers. And the existing form. homeowners could do it at any time, correct? What's they, that? The existing homeowners could do it at any time. They don't correct. need to be on the brink of a you sale. You could waive fees for those rezonings if you yeah. so chose as well. Okay. So you, if it, if it was one of those things, they'd still need to get the application together. But I mean, it'd be a pretty simple application. Yeah. How much does it cost for them to rezone? A rezoning with a future land use map, and then there's two applications for that size property. I mean, you're looking probably $800. $800? Wow. At least, yeah. That's a lot then, of money. Mm -hmm. By the time you pay for signage and letters. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the two applications they get you to. Just the rezoning would be less than five. Well, but still. The big thing is you're looking at at least two months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Least. It's the timing that it takes to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I. I think that's the best option, though, 
is just have them come in and do rezoning if they want to, and we'll waive the fees for it. It allows us to kind of take it and, and document to mm -hmm. the change the mindset with the change. And stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, Hello. I would make sure that they include an addendum in their closing documents that states they understand that the adjacent property owners or businesses. Right. Yeah, I, I don't see a lot of uh, impact from those businesses that are there. Now. Yeah, they're pretty quiet. They're obviously in the middle place, state business inside. So. Okay. Uh, All right, we ready to move on. Item E, we've got a second amendment to the contract with PSW. Those, the, really the next two are, are linked, uh, and the reasons that they're on there. Uh, the first one, the Tunnel Spangler Walsh contract was reduced because we took over the uh, design of the market uh, internally, took that out of their original contract, and then the, uh, uh, the county IGA needed an addendum because the, uh, uh, the original IGA included the description of the library as part of a three-story building. And when the theater left, we, we took the library and the second floor out, separated it from the market, and so we're changing that description for the, uh, for the county. Their numbers do not change. They're still paying for the design of the library and a certain percentage of the parking deck. Okay. All right, so those are those two topics. We do have quite a few things on our executive session agenda, and we don't have enough time, but we do have one thing. Do we need to talk about that one? Property? Yes. Yeah. So we do have one item we need to get to before the meeting. And then we'll just have to come back after the meeting for that other. So this will be for real estate. And okay. then um, this, we can just stay in, well, no, we have to come out of Zach. So this executive session will just be for real estate. And then we'll need to come back, though, for the potential litigation and employment matters. Okay. Okay, so during the work session of the Mayor and City Council of Snellville, Georgia, Mayor Bender announced that certain matters <coughs> should be discussed in the closed session of the meeting and asked.